My name is Bella Naiman. I'm one of the co-founders of New York City Jewelry Week. In case this is your first time joining us, uh, New York City Jewelry Week is dedicated to promoting and celebrating the world of jewelry through educational and innovative focused programming, like the one that we have here for you today. Our ongoing web series, Jewelry Confidants, allows you to eavesdrop with permission on conversations between some of the most brilliant minds within the jewelry industry. And today we're so excited for this conversation with Otto Yako and Diane Batista. Um, so I will, um, I will introduce Diane first, but um, I do want to point out that next month um, we'll be taking a break from our Jewelry Confidant series to bring you uh, exciting events in partnership with NYC by Design. Uh, one of those events will be a conversation between Jill Newman and Glenn Spiro that's happening on May 13th, which is also a Thursday. So um, stay tuned to our Instagram and to our mailers uh, to get the link for that conversation. But today we are here for Otto and Diane. Um, Diane Batista is the director and senior specialist at Rago, Art, uh, Rago Wright Auction Houses. Prior to joining Rago last year, she was consulting as archive manager at David Webb. With over 30 years of experience in the industry, Diane worked at Christie's for 10 years where she last held the position of assistant vice president, senior jewelry specialist. She later served as a consultant with Christie's and cataloged auctions in New York, London and Geneva, including the Elizabeth Taylor online auction. She was the director of the Dior Fine Jewelry, um, Dior Fine Jewelry in New York, and Cinta Jewelry Director at John Hardy. An original jewelry expert on PBS's Antiques Roadshow, Diane has lectured extensively on antique and estate jewelry. Her confidant today is Otto Jacob. Um, Otto Jacob is a self-taught artist goldsmith. Between 1977 and 1980, he studied painting with George Baselitz. After this exposure to contemporary art, he embarked on a journey to unite his passion for fine art and mineralogy, teaching himself the old techniques through the treatises of Cellini and guided by the ideas of Etruscan and Celtic jewelry. Since 1980, he has devoted himself exclusively to the creation of jewelry. Early collectors of Otto's work were the renowned contemporary German artists, including George Baselitz, Jörg Emmendorfer, Marcus Luppert, Gunther Forg, and Sigmar Pock. Otto Jakob lives and works in Karlsruhe, Germany. His works are exclusively available um, at his atelier, at TAFE of Maastricht, and TAFE of New York in the fall. Thank you both so much for being here. I'm so excited for this conversation. And before I hand it over to you, I will start off the way we always do. How did you two meet? Who wants to go first, Diane? Sure. Um, well, glad to be here and happy Earth Day to everyone. I think Otto is sort of a perfect choice for this day. Um, Otto and I met in New York, and so a jeweler, Janet Mavic, who had a store on Madison Avenue, had contacted Otto and begun carrying Otto's work in New York at the time, and I was also working with Janet, and we became sort of fast friends as well as I was immediately drawn to his work, which really, I think, spurred the interest. So it's been a long time, and we just continue to keep in touch. Yeah, I, I really uh, have a long time. We, we met the first time in Janet's uh, uh, shop and I immediately saw that uh, Diane was drawn extremely uh, and she was, I think she was the best seller of my pieces in New York and she started to, yeah, to equip uh, knowledgeable people with the first pieces I made. And that was around 22 years or so uh, before. And in this time, I hope something happened with me and we will see it uh, in this conversation, if it went up or down. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, Otto, I, as far as, getting to know you, I've had the fortunate ability to really continue to get to know you over the years. 
but I'd love to for you to share a little bit of that with the audience here and really to know how did you get started in jewelry? And I know that you do so much handwork, but how did it all begin? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Bella uh, talked about my self-taught uh, beginning. I would say I'm self-taught till now because in fact, I didn't have a living teacher till now. So uh, yeah, how was I uh, starting? I started as a, a teenager. Uh, I was a hippie there with 17 years old. And uh, yeah, I, my, interested, my interest in art started there. And the funny thing was uh, that I never had a very traditional idea of jewelry maybe because my father went with me to the museums and looked to the Etruscan uh, displays. And I, I was more interested in the very old, unusual uh, pieces. And in fact, I was, from the beginning, I was bored from modern jewelry when I saw it in the uh, modern displays. And so I focused on this as a child. And uh, even as a child, I had some ideas how to make things like this. I didn't know at this time that I would definitely become a goldsmith, but I was very practical. So that's pro possibly a reason why I decided one time that I will be self-taught and I will teach myself in every part of the uh, uh, goldsmithing. And I never feared that I would fail. Yeah. And it, it was really interesting. I wanted to become a painter in the beginning. I, I studied uh, uh, art at the Art Academy uh, and my teacher was George Baselitz. After these uh, three and a half years, it ended with a crash. I saw I'm not original enough uh, with painting. I was very critical and I stopped. And uh, I didn't want to become a provincial painter. And uh, I wanted to be important, but it was not possible. Then I had two weeks, a wild, a wild dream in these two weeks showed me a kind of slideshow of my jewelry. I only should make. So I had the target and I only had to teach myself to be able to make these pieces I had in mind from this time on. This dream was so wild that I didn't have the time to draw all these images. These were the finished pieces of jewelry I saw in this half dream. And then I wrote everything down in this night. It was four, four o'clock uh, in the morning. And then I had two papers filled with the symbols, with everything I, I have seen. And from this moment on, I was clear and positive and my self-confidence doing this for the rest of my life was there and it never went down. And even, you know how it is, if you start to, to uh, do your things yourself, you do a lot of mistakes. I knew that will happen, but it was not a problem for me. I made it one time, two times, three times, and sometimes the fourth time. Then I had the first piece, I made a hook on it, then I made the next. And the, the very unusual thing is that I had these images in my brain. So I didn't have to invent something. I only had to find the technical solutions. 
And, yeah. and I think that you're continuing to do that today. I mean, I, I'm always it's amazed a, that you continue. The, it's to, a life journey, yeah. Yeah, to just really follow this uh, dream, but also to try to solve the problems of what your dream has told you. So it's a, it, we could all learn, follow our dreams, I think. Um, as well, when I look at your jewelry and something that's always fascinated me about your jewelry is that while it changes and there's clear evolution in design, I'm so interested that there also is a very distinct um, characteristic and personality to it. And what, what would you say in your words, what is your signature or what is distinct about your work um, as I opposed think, to others? I think my signature, I, I was very attached to nature from my childhood on. So I joined my father, uh, I was sitting in the meadows. My father was uh, uh, painting aquarelles uh, in the Black Forest, and I was sitting in the meadow and I, I studied uh, the beetles uh, in the meadow. So that was, uh, I think that was very important because I learned to concentrate on tiny things and I ad admired uh, my things I found in nature. I took home things, insects, what else, pieces of uh, any piece which was interesting. Sometimes I found crystals. That was very early too. So I digged and found small crystals. And it was, these all things were uh, treasures for me. And uh, so I, uh, I a, a kind of, um, I found a kind of um, uh, yeah, group, group of things which were so important for me, even in the future, even till now. And from, and when I, uh, on the other day, uh, went with my father to the museums to look at uh, uh, the ancient uh, precious things, I found a German jeweler from the Renaissance. That was Wenzel Jammitzer. Uh, it's like, I would say he is a German Benvenuto Cellini. And he invented uh, nature casts. So he found things in nature, everything he found he found a solution how to cast those. So you can see table objects filled up with insects, frogs, snakes, everything you, you can imagine. He found them, he made nature casts of them. You think you have the real animal in front of you. And uh, I was so inspired by this. And uh, yeah, and later when I came into uh, an age where you start to think, what will I do? Which kind of style want I to develop? Then I thought, why is there no one who tells a story like Wenzel Jamnitzer? And I, thought about telling a new story with probably these old techniques. And I learned how to do nature casts of the beetles I have collected, of flowers I saw which were so beautiful. And I tried to find solutions how to cast them as natural as, po as possible. And over the time, it worked, it got better over the years, and it's a part of my work, but it's only a segment of my work because I have different other interests. So the other interest is possibly to use unusual materials, uh, which are normally not used in jewelry. 
uh, and uh, so I I was always collecting minerals. I told you and crystals uh, too, right? Uh, crystals, unusual crystals. You see here, for example, this pendant. That's a group of uh, uh, beautiful, beautifully uh, grown, uncut, so no one has polished something on it. Uh, uh, amethyst uh, crystals, which change their color to the top where they are rock crystals. Uh, underneath, they are uh, uh, amethysts. And they come from Mexico. And yeah, and collecting, collecting, collecting makes you possible uh, to, to have a, a big stock of things. And finally, you pick one thing out because you have an idea. And that was this eagle who needed for me a kind of ignition to be able to fly. And this ignition yeah. is the group of the crystals. The crystal. So it's a powerful thing like a rocket in uh, Florida from the NASA. Propels it to Earth. Yeah, and, it's fantastic. Uh, Otto, yeah. um, I know that you are a collector. So just tell us quickly a little bit about your collections. I think behind you, you have your, I know you collect beetles, like, um, insects, insects, but insects, plants. Tell us a little bit about your collections. I, I'm collecting uh, uh, intensely shells from the sea. Sometimes I found them after storms. Even in, I remember uh, South Carolina after a storm, I found fantastic things on the beach. Uh, There's and, a bracelet. I remember a bracelet you made. For example, yeah. From sometimes, that. sometimes collected, collected all the things which were uh, put together on one place and I decided to use all these different things in a bracelet. So these were branches, these were shells, these were parts of uh, crabs. And so you have, uh, you have this um, status of uh, a small square after a storm on this beach. And that I made a bracelet with. And uh, yeah, so it's always a kind of uh, a narrative idea behind all those things. I don't want to use uh, uh, rare things uh, to, to make them uh, uh, showy and that's it. I, I want to tell a story and uh, that's so important. So, but collecting is, is important that you have an open eye for everything. So I collect um, uh, now for around more than 40 years, uh, rare succulent plants. Some of them were uh, discovered uh, not 30 years before, and they come from Madagascar, they come from Somalia, they come from the Yemen, uh, I think the huh? flower earrings, I think the flower earrings that were shown before this slide, for example, these these, one of your plants, these are uh, the, the name of the plant is adenium obesum, that's a Latin uh, 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 word for it, and I have four of them in my collection, these are uh, big, chunky, uh, bodies uh, with small branches, and when they have, uh, when they are after the growing time, they look like a stone, and you don't have an idea that they are a plant. And in spring, they they always stand on places in my uh, uh, home where you couldn't place any other plant because it would would burn down. So oh, wow. I, I keep it on the south side. So I heat them up the whole summer. And uh, then 
in spring, after a dry time of half a year, they blossom without water. And that's is this a nature cast? Uh, is that's this the nature, nature cast? cast? That's the nature cast of these blossoms. Uh, the complication was when I started uh, casting blossoms uh, was always that blossoms are extremely thin. So you normally you can't cast and even I, I remember when I when I bought a, a very uh, modern perfect casting machine, I asked uh, the engineer who have built this if I can do this with blossom. He said, "Forget it." No. <laughs> and and despite his uh, things, he talked. He talked to me. I decided to buy it, and and I needed half a year. And then I found out how to cast this. And the cast up the most perfect cast you can do, and because they are so thin. But I had to develop uh, a kind of uh, unusual uh, method to be able to to make this and so <laughs> they look big they are extremely light they are like like feathers and they are made from high carat gold and they are enamel inside and outside and so they are really the blossoms of this uh, plant i conservated in these uh, earrings. It's and they're fantastic. I love I love them. I I was always drawn to your many flowers that you've done. Um, but what also intrigued me is always the detail, the detail of the work. And I know this is an example, but also but I think I in your pendants, in your hands, you see such good detail in your work. That's another, that's another important Speak topic, to that, yeah. topic of my work. I, you know, I was, before I was at an art academy, there were all these sculptures, uh, people who made sculptures, and uh, I, I wasn't really amazed by uh, making big things. So when I decided to become a, a goldsmith, I, I was really interested to invent microcosms. So scale down, uh, find solutions to, to show details you see if you, go around three times uh, around the piece and then you realize, oh, there is another detail and there is another detail. And the only thing uh, or, or one of the things I took from the art academy into my uh, goldsmithing was that I always wanted to do things three-dimensional. So I don't like jewelry. Uh, which is beautiful in front and empty in the back. And uh, so I never had this idea. From the beginning, I wanted to do things. You take them off from the ear or you, you, you take the pendant off and you turn it and you are amazed to see the other things which are kind of secret for you because the other person who sees, who looks at the front, doesn't realize that there yeah. is this beautiful bag. Okay, from this uh, behavior, it was uh, clear that uh, I developed things you could use from both sides. So, yeah. for example, it's I true. can can turn them and then you see another reality. And uh, that's really- This one has a secret in it. This, yeah, this I is about have, what it's holding or th what it is. Yeah. The, For example, even the, the, the use, how, how to use stones. If you look to this detail of uh, the hand pendant you see here, you see this skull of a raven. 
the hand holds this cow. And if you look into the empty uh, part, eyes. eyes are, eye sockets. you see that I embedded in the back uh, big uh, rose cap diamonds from both sides. So you look into it, it's not frontal, it's back side. And, uh, and if you turn it, you see the sparkle of the stones, beautiful stones. And How did you get the, on this, on this piece in particular, um, you can really see the texture in the enameling, which I love. So tell us about that. Is that that you had to, to create the texture on that white enamel? Yeah, uh, normally you wouldn't, normally if you would have a, a regular uh, enameled uh, piece of jewelry, you would say this kind of surface of this white is not good. But uh, we created this. We not, it, it, the easiest way is you you know how it how it works. Uh, enamel is a glass powder, which is uh, put onto the gold surface. You must know everything you see here, even if you see not very much gold. Everything is a cast from eighteen carat or twenty two carat gold, and so this golden skull, this golden hand will be enameled by putting uh, the glass powder, the black on the hand, uh, the, the white uh, on the skull. You, you do it separately, you put it onto it, and then you uh, dry it, and then it comes into an oven with a very high temperature, and you have a temperature of 1100 Fahrenheit or something to, to be able to melt the glass powder onto the gold. And then normally, if you do it regularly, you have a very uh, flat and shiny white on it. But right. a skull, if you find a skull in the forest, it's not looking like shiny or something. So it's rotten, it's uh, eroded. And, and that's the character of something like this, if you find it. And so I, we, tried, we, we, we tried to enamel with other temperatures to make this, to make this, to give this piece the idea of a rotten piece. I think and, you were very successful. Yeah. I, think, I think it really works. And after that, we, we paint it with a fine gold painting, right. which we put with tiny brushes onto it. And you see these uh, lines. These are the lines you exactly have if you see if you study skulls, they have these, I don't know how, it, how it's called in English. In German, you say fontanelles. Uh, these are these, these tiny uh, uh, channels. And we decided to make this with fine gold. And then, and then we, we burn it in the oven. And then it's, uh, yeah, combined now with this. And it, you don't lose it anymore and these are all the i would say the good thing is that i originally studied painting and so painting was really uh, finally after i i had this crash on the art academy where i uh, realized that i'm not a painter at all then i saw it was very good that i have studied this because you can use it for all sure. the surfaces and uh, coloring of things. So you have another uh, uh, freedom to, With that skill. to allow yourself to do this or this, which normally uh, traditionally uh, educated goldsmiths wouldn't allow himself. 
So I'm very, okay, now I'm working more than 42 years or something. So I'm getting older, but I'm more free than ever. And so I'm really focused on uh, uh, the, the tale I want to tell you. And uh, that's the mo most important thing. And there I, I don't allow compromises. And, uh, and finally something comes out and uh, I never think about is someone in the world who is able to buy this or who wants to buy this. I, I never had this question in my head. I only have this question, is it fascinating enough for me myself? And if that's I the artist. Failed, I mean, that, that, yeah, is, that I think yeah, is really yeah, the artist yeah, in you yeah, um, yeah. and the creations that you're, you're making. And with that artistry, I also, in listening to you, I hear you say we, and I want everyone to understand a little bit about your workshop. I was so fortunate to go to Karlsruhe and visit you, but you run a very traditional atelier workshop. And yet it may surprise people how contemporary and advanced your techniques are. So tell us a little bit about where you're working and how that comes into play yeah. with what yeah, you're okay. doing. I'm working with 10 people in my studio. And uh, some of them are working now for more than 20 or 25 years. Most of them are female. And uh, yeah, it's wonderful because we have a very big knowledge about each other and we trust in each other and we work together. I'm a worker. I, uh, I can't think about a role I had on the, uh, in, in the office and I let my work and my people work and I would work with them. So I'm always working on the bench and, uh, and I'm uh, always trying with a, with a new piece to develop ideas, how to make it. And when I make it with my hands, possible that it worked. Then I give it to my people and then I, yeah, I walk with them and, uh, and uh, uh, join them uh, to, to go the right path. And uh, sometimes I do corrections, sometimes because we, we know so much of each other, sometimes I give a piece I'm working on to someone and I tell him, please continue for two hours and I take your piece and I continue working on your piece. And that really can work perfectly because that's very trustful and it doesn't spoil. If I only would take the piece from someone and would change something and give it back, that's a wrong uh, procedure, but I, I'm doing my mistakes. They are doing their mistakes and we develop our evolution together. And, and that's really over the decades we work now, it yeah. developed in a wonderful way. And uh, therefore I'm working. I'm, I'm 69 now. I think the most important thing will happen in the future. And I hope uh, uh, I'm uh, blessed enough uh, to be healthy uh, a long time in the next two decades to, to do these things. Like an artist, you know, an artist yeah. isn't going uh, to be retired from someone. Uh, he's, he decides to, to end the work. And I, I know some artists, they, they ended the work. Yeah, when they died. Well, we hope you don't end your work. You just keep, keep creating and keep thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And I know one thing that inspires you a lot, Otto, is your travels. And be so you're a collector, the nature, that's one part of your work. But also when you look at your work, there's so many cultural influences that fascinate me 
And I always am so interested in telling the stories of the different pieces and where you traveled. So what, what, um, what would you say is impactful about your travels or the cultures that you are exposed to? Impactful was always uh, the exotic uh, feeling I had when even as a child, when I looked to the Idraskan work or if I look to Egyptian uh, uh, faience or what else, and uh, it always uh, stimulated. Or I, I remember, I one day I, I saw uh, an exhibition of uh, Ashanti gold of uh, Ghana and Ghana, Africa, and I saw this uh, overwhelming golden pieces, big pieces five times bigger than uh, European or American jewelry. Uh -huh. And I enjoyed so much. And I saw this opulence and uh, uh, this energy of it. And these, all these things inspired me very much. In the, in the first time where I didn't have a hill of money uh, as a young guy, I, had to be satisfied to go to the museums and to, to look at the strange, strange things I always focused on. But later when, I, uh, when my uh, uh, success uh, developed and I, I had my collectors and my people who admired my work, then I was able to, to travel to these uh, uh, very foreign, countries like Cambodia or that's for example is inspired this ring is inspired uh, from Italian pietra dura work that's uh, they did tables where they have carved plates and set together like puzzles you know yes really it? beautiful things uh, you can buy that for a lot of money at the art fairs and I always was fascinated to do things like this in a much smaller scale. And I always collected, uh, uh, for example, here, agates. These are all right. from the, the agate. old collection. I, some of the pieces in this ring were collected, I think I was 14, uh, and I traveled with my brother with a bicycle to Ida Oberstein, that's uh, the place in Germany where they cut stones. And originally in earlier centuries, they found their agates. And there are places where you can find agates till now. And there I was digging and finding <laughs> it. And 30 years later, I found it and I said, that could be wonderful with this uh, uh, pink uh, diamond. And uh, yeah, and then you have to learn how to cut and how to be precise and how to be astonishing. And uh, yeah, but that's the thing. I think because I'm self-taught, it probably that was my stimulation to show the people who say, oh, oh yeah, I understand you are self-taught. Uh, I want to show them that I'm better than the traditionally <laughs> educated ones. And right, you want to show what really, you that taught really, yourself. Uh, I would say that was a, a, a level I always placed very high where I had to jump over. And uh, yeah. And that's a challenge. Now. Uh, we, I mean, speaking of cultures, I'll, I'll have to tell the story that Otto and I separately just happened to both be in India at the same time and that's ran into really, each other. So that was, oh, that was, that's just something I, I think is so incredible to, uh, yeah. to have happened and to know. Yeah. It was, and, uh, uh, it was a Maharaja palace in Udaipur. Uh, which is, uh, yeah, very incredible. And I think especially the garden where you yeah. look over the landscape and the peacocks are walking there through the 
blossomed uh, uh, parts of the uh, incredible uh, park. And there is a terrace. That's where, where we are. Where you can have your tea time. That's right. And we had our tea in the morning and uh, Diane walked onto the terrace and we met and we didn't have an appointment. Oh, we, incredible. By accident, we met 10,000 kilometers away from our homeland. And it was really, for me, it was, I, I saw immediately uh, if you have this knowledge, if you have this taste, it can happen that people like her and me who were connected before meet at the same places on the other side of the world. And that's yeah. so funny. Love it. It was really great. It was fun. Fun thing. And with this ring that we're showing now, um, I'm so excited by this ring because it's a ring I've never gotten to hold anything like this from you. And so tell us about what this is. What is the inspiration? I know it's one of your newest pieces. So everyone's getting a debut here. So tell us more. Yeah, uh, I think uh, if you look through my work, if you, if you go to the website or Instagram or what else you see, immediately that I'm uh, also a kind of symbolist and I, I want to do things which are kind of uh, fetish for people. And uh, I think women have a new role today. And I decided to go back to tradition in Asia and India, and there they have a kind of ring that's an archer ring. Where that's a ring who has a nose, which is worn that the nose is showing to you and will, you wear it on the middle finger. And with this nose, you can draw your bow and shoot uh, the arrow. And, uh, these rings, you see the nose here where the diamonds are. And yeah, I said that's, a, that's now a modern symbol again. That's, that's a ring for women, for powerful women. And yeah, I want I, one. Huh? And on the other hand, I'm, 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 you see always in my pieces, I'm extremely inspired by uh, cultural solutions of tribes of what else and I think if you look here it looks like carving into wood made by Maori, Maori people or tattooing you know this tattoos in Africa where they even made tattoos which are kind of relief on on the skin they do it artfully, artfully, very beautiful. And I thought it would be wonderful if these rings are carved like a beautiful skin of a fantastic person. And so I carved them. These are all my carvings. And, uh, and then there came the next idea. That's my invention. Beautiful. I, I thought... These, these carvings, for example, they are very much inspired by wood carvings of the Maori. And I'm a, by the way, I'm a collector of um, uh, South Sea tribal art. And uh, so I'm having things from uh, Papua New Guinea, from the Marquesas, what else? I have beautiful things. And uh, yeah, and so I wanted to have these beautiful carvings. I wanted to have the inside enamel with symbols. So you have on the one side, you have these, this flower. On the other side, you have a spiky star inside. Here you ah, see. Oh, wow. Which is black. Yeah, and, uh, powerful. Yeah. And 
you see what I invented. Normally these archer rings have this one nose, which makes them very uh, special and you immediately understand that's an archer ring. Right. But I thought, let's have a second nose and you can turn the ring. And so you have oh. two, two heads of the ring. I and see. So you have, you, you have the, the bigger nose with the rubies uh, you saw before. Uh -huh. and you, these are, that's the one, the bigger nose. And the other side, you have a slightly smaller nose with the diamonds. It's fantastic. So you have two rings, really. You have two rings, yeah. You, you know, it's really, really good. Yeah, you will... the thing I, I was really amazed of that it could be a, an extremely modern feeling if you have a ring like this. Yeah. And you always have this secret underneath. You understand? It's completely and modern. And uh... you have the rubies underneath or the diamonds underneath. And well, one we day, have to do... Huh? What we have to do is get you back to New York, to Tefaf in New York, after yeah. all COVID is done. Uh, it, it show will us be this ring. To, 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 to try them on. And to yes, see it. exactly. It we all want to do that. And yeah, with yeah. that, trying on the jewelry, um, I can't wait to see you in New York whenever you do get to I'm come um, next. And we will share a meal. And so I want to leave everyone with a recommendation from me because Otto and I love to eat. We also like a glass of fine wine with our dinner. So Otto, give a good recommendation because you always choose great restaurants. I love one restaurant over a long time. And uh, because it exists now, I think for 10 years or so, you see that it must be very good because normally uh, there is a, a big pace of change and uh, you, you don't have the, the opportunity to have a, a restaurant over such a long time. And that's a Japanese restaurant and the name is Tomoe Sushi. And it's in Thompson Street I don't know the number, but you will find it. And that I, I traveled two times Japan and I visited the province to find uh, very unusual things there. And we always had to eat in the very regular, uh, simple provincial restaurants and simple people's provincial, restaurants, simple provincial. Yeah. Uh, that means in Japan, extremely refined food. So it's not like Burger King. It's really handmade, beautiful regional food from this part of the country, including the fish of the coast, including the uh, vegetables, the special vegetables, and the unusual ways uh, to, to, to serve it. So Tomo, and, and, you said Tomo, Tomo, right? Tomo Isushi gave me the feeling of this uh, uh, simple lock cabin, uh, uh, like you find it in the Japanese countryside. And uh, it's just as authentic as there. I and, hope we uh, can meet there soon. It's a, it's, a, it's a wooden blockhouse, it's small, you, you, have, you cannot make a reservation, you have to wait. All the people who wait are nice, so you get contact, you have Perfect. new friends, and uh, after half an hour you go in. And I, for example, I can't, I can't recommend wine there because I think no. that- You have to have beer, do right? It, do it correctly, you, uh, I would say Japanese draft beer. You I think so. Uh, we'll save our wine for another night. And I, I wouldn't uh, say that people should uh, expect too much sushi. They have very traditional uh, meals. And I always, when I go there, I think the first thing I eat there are boiled eggs in broth. Oh. Uh, and, and boiled oysters, not, not eggs, boiled oysters in broth. Oysters, okay. And, 
Yeah. It's Sound, your, that actually sounds fantastic. Pray to God so, that you have another chance to eat it again. We'll, so, we'll see so you there that, soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank it's you. Wonderful. And everything you get is first choice. It's affordable. That's a good thing. You're making us hungry. It's much cheaper than all the other uh, fancy restaurants you, you can choose for. And it's so authentic. And okay, Bella. Way, I, are I, we I, going? <laughs> We're I, going. Was, We're going, I going sure. there, When I was going there, I think two times I met clients who were sitting in and they said, it's the best. It's okay. The best. Yeah. We got it. This is when I become the third wheel in this conversation um, <laughs> because we have some really great questions from the audience and I want to make sure that we get to them. Um, but I'm certainly ready to go out and eat in restaurants in New York. So thank you for that recommendation because Japanese food is certainly the one thing I can't make at home. So um, I do want to get to our first question and that is from Eric Pullman's. And the question is, Otto, do you embrace the new technological techniques such as 3D scanning and drilling, and can it enhance your imagination? Yeah, uh, because I'm a self-taught man from the beginning, I was also interested in very modern technology. I had to learn all the old things, the traditional techniques, but I, I'm very used to, from uh, since a long time, to have laser, 3D scans, uh, 3D, even 3D printing in parts of my work, which I embed, you wouldn't think that someone like me does it. Uh, you wouldn't expect, and you wouldn't find it. You, you look to the piece and you think, is it, uh, is it uh, Renaissance? Is it modern? You, you really feel that it's something in between and something looks very modern, something looks like an ancient style. Uh, but inside you have a mechanical device which is developed by 3D scan and uh, 3D print. And so I, I'm always interested in using modern technology because it helps you to, to keep parts uh, which are not changeable as ancient techniques. They keep you this part reservated to be able to work there because something does your printer for you and you don't have to build up a, a, a mechanical uh, movement or something. Yeah, and that's something- a, That does the printer. Did I, did I answer the question correctly? Also, with that question, Otto, I think I think something that people would like to know too is that you invent so many of your all of your findings and all of the intricate um, mechanisms that you're speaking about. You invent them, but you do use this very modern technology mixed with the ancient crafts, and that that combination is just it's really mixed. if you would look, it's a mix. If you it's would a, look into my workshop. You would see two printers in uh, downstairs, and you would see that someone is enameling like a person in the Renaissance for three days to make a hand like this. You saw in the pendant, and that's the enameling. And when you have done this, you have two other days to paint this gold uh, 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 tattoos onto it that it looks like a Marquesa's tattoo. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the hand you saw. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there we are extremely conservative on the one hand. On the other hand, we use all the things uh, which help us to, uh, to dig out another space for example, probably very old methods we want to keep because they cannot be changed. And then we decide to make it like this of carving stones or something. That's a very old technique. 
you not really can do it very differently in modern times than it was made in the 19th century or so. So let's keep it. But other things, for example, very, very good thing to tell you is earlier, I, when I wanted to make a nature cast, then I had to find something which had the size for a piece of my jewelry. And it had, you know, my, my jewelry is not big. For example, uh, as an idea for the, the people who listen, the hand pendant has a length of 2.6 inch. Mm. So it's not big. Yeah, tiny. And you look to the details, you can't believe that we were able to put all the things into it. And, but uh, yeah, what, what did I say? Uh, well, Bella, we'll go on with the next question. What? Yeah, we, no, we had another technical question actually. Um, somebody wanted to know, Carol Negro wanted to know, um, why do you work with beeswax rather than other carving waxes? We use every wax. So if we want to, to build up things like a uh, wood carver, we use the carving wax. Yeah, you can uh, work with uh, drilling tools and uh, you can work with carving instruments. But uh, I, I read something of Melanie Grant about my work. She made a post about my work in, in her Instagram and she said, mostly interesting she thinks is that this, this guy uh, uses gold like rubber. Uh, and yes. that's something you can, uh, you can do it if you use a soft wax. And we sometimes use so soft wax the, the softest of all, that if you only touch it, you have a print on it. Mm -hmm. And if you understand this, sometimes we, we, we need for it to not to uh, distract it too much. We need a cooling spray. So we cool it, it's a little bit harder, but sometimes I need it very soft to change the form and to do a shape you wouldn't be able to do with, with anything else. Sometimes I use clay mm -hmm. and I, I do things the size of a hand or something. I made a fish recently, uh, which is turning around the coral. So I, I made it with clay and I, I, I do the carvings with my fingernail and so, and okay. Then, That's the sculptor, the real sculptor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I have this, what, what to do with it? I want to have a fish like this. Uh, so it's this big, but good reason for doing it this big in clay. And then we do a 3D scan of it and then we scale it down. And you reduce it. And, and then because we make an earring, we mirror it. And then the next step is, that's my invention I found, we do casts which have uh, the thickness of a, of a newspaper uh, paper. Incredible. Yeah. So, and then it's going to become light. It has to be printed in uh, wax with a, a 3D printer, and then we cast it like in traditional uh, solutions. But that's the way how to create something in a different way. And because you made it with a different material, you have a different smell. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's completely, you, it's like that what, what Melanie Grant said, it's uh, he, uh -huh. turns, he turns it uh, like, uh, he, he turns gold like, into yeah. rubber or, mm -hmm. or backwards. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing I'm really interested and I want to transform things. Yeah. So that's the same like uh, David Bowie uh, used Baroque music and changed it into the way he's, he, he found a song. And if you listen to it, you realize that he had the knowledge, he had the knowledge 
of all these old treasures he used in his music, but he transformed it. And that's the thing I want. I, everything yeah, is done. You, you're get, you have, have it. Done. If you if you do it so traditionally, so we have uh, diamonds, sapphires, emeralds, rubies, and we have gold, white, or, or, or yellow, then I, I think then we are finished before we start. Uh, but if we uh, change the system or if we translate something into another language we found, or so then we have a possibility to create something very unusual or even something you never saw before. And okay, that's my hope to find things you have not seen before. So we Sometimes have a few things I probably found that might be, but uh, you have, to, you have, yeah. There are a few more questions that Bella is going to ask. Okay. No, but it's it's a perfect segue to what you're saying in terms of finding something new. And one of the questions from the audience, and I see that we're a little bit over time, and that's okay because I want to get this question in. But one of the questions from the audience was, "Are there any new designers or artists uh, that you're that you're looking at? It, you know, whose work is new and novel and interesting to you? Um, so, is there anyone sort of um, that you admire now?" Uh, I think uh, these few people I admire, they are definitely not so young. Uh, the one is younger than me, that's Taffin. You know, uh, yeah. Mr. GPT, I love his work, it's fantastic. And I love this reduction. Uh, probably yeah. I wouldn't be able uh, to to be that reduced like he uh, he works, I think he we we met one day at my stand in New York and uh, I think we appreciate both. Uh, so he I hope he appreciates my work. He said it to me, but I really love his work because there is a lot of new potential and uh, and I think it a kind of uniqueness with simplicity. That's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, okay, that uh, uh, godfather of uh, old, uh, uh, highly creative artists, that's Jar. Mm -hmm. So Jar is uh, someone who, uh, yeah, who motivated me to go my way. But I would be the last to uh, copy his way how to make flowers or how to make uh, narrative things. It's very American and I'm very German, very European. And I think we, yeah, we both know each other. And I think we, we love the work of the other because, because no one tries to copy the other and I but there are not very much artists in the jewelry section and I think he is one of the highest and uh, Teffen is one and probably if you would uh, dig very much uh, then you would find some few others I would say that's okay the one I Love that I have to tell you. That's Bagat. Who is this? Bagat. Viren Bagat. Oh, Bagat. India. He yeah. is uh, incredible. That's, uh, I would say, that's, uh, that's the most beautiful fairy tale in jewelry. I think what you're speaking to, which I think is so interesting in jewelry design, and it's what I continue to look for is I'm always looking for the jeweler that is really telling their tale and has their voice. And whatever that is, you look at their work and you know it's by them. And I really think that that's one of the most important points about looking at new jewelers and looking at the work is really finding who is speaking from their heart, whose voice is coming through and doing original work. 
And then I look at the workmanship and the craft of it. Um, but I think the ones you're mentioning, you know, are at the highest level of having their voice. So that's something I would encourage any jeweler to find your voice and go with your dream as, as Otto has. I think uh, for me, it's necessary to find someone uh, who has a philosophy which fills up all my uh, things I could expect. And that's the same with my work. If I'm not uh, following uh, a philosophy which developed more and more over the decades, and so you, it's like a, it's like a big hype through your life where you have some targets. One day you, you reach the one target, then you go to the next and you try to climb up. You don't want to climb down. So uh, that's really, okay, that depends on, on you yourself if you are so, uh, have such a high demand for yourself. And, but that, on the other hand, that's a good thing. It keeps you young. And uh, sure. not, not, not physically, but uh, the head works yeah. very Ever much. changing. Yeah, and you always have to change. That's so important. And uh, if you are uh, uh, repeating things, stop, stop it and go to be retired. Uh, uh, so I really want to go always into new parts of uh, things I've never done before and the thing you have to, to live with if you start this then you start from the beginning and in the beginning you are not very uh, elite so after a while you, you can use your experience and but you go a new way it's like a new dance you make. Yeah. You never make this dance. And so you are struggling in the beginning. You have to accept, you spoil something, you go back, you start again. And so that's the thing. I, new chapters. That's my, that's my lifelong experience. But uh, after a while, when you did it 50 times or more, then you see it works. Finally, it works, and it makes you uh, able to do different things, which are, not, your which are not the really way like industrial jewelry, jewelry or what else. And it's filled up with meaning and uh, with uh, magic. And uh, you can't create magic. You see it after you did it. Is it magic or not? If not, Put it away. Back to nature, the magic of nature. So it takes yeah. us back to that Earth Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you both so very much. This thank has, you. This has been magical, and the comments are just supporting that. Everyone is so um, it's just so full of gratitude for this conversation. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Otto, for your time. It's been really incredible. Um, Diane, you have Otto's book behind you. I do. Um, let me let me show you. Just in case um, you all want to know more about Otto's book, Otto's work, but also the book, uh, it's really wonderful. It's great. Um, <laughs> Has illustrations. So we highly, we highly encourage you all to seek it out. Um, and hopefully we'll see you soon in New York, Otto. Um, thank you both Absolutely. so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. Thank you, Otto. See you soon. Yeah. All the best. Thank you. Thank, thank you all so much for joining us talking. today. Yeah. <laughs> thank you I, so much for joining us. We'll have this conversation on our YouTube channel um, within the next few days. Um, so you can share it with your friends. Please follow us on Instagram. Um, and you probably already are all, you know, subscribers to our mailing list, but if not, we encourage you to visit our website and sign up. 
And we'll have news soon about uh, the Glenn Spiro talk on May 13th with a link for you to register. So thank you all so very much. Otto, Diane, thank you once again and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All the best.